Welcome to Double Portion Inheritance with Maria Marola and Gary Wold, brought to you by DoublePortionInheritance.com. Since 1981, Maria heard the call of Yahuwah to become a watchman to the House of Yisrael and to those within the traditional Christian church. She was instructed to warn them against the false doctrines and pagan traditions of men. After 25 years of studying scripture, the word of Yahuwah came to Maria again in 2007 as she was called out of the corporate world to become a full-time intercessor and prophetic teacher. The name of the ministry, Double Portion Inheritance, was given to her after she received the revelation of the two houses of Israel from Ezekiel 37, 16. The mission of this ministry is to bring together the stick of Judah and the stick of Joseph for the return of the Messiah, Yehushua. And now, Maria Marola. Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Today is February the 25th, 2023. We've already done part one today of A Watchman's Warning about the Asbury Revival, and now we are moving on to part two in this series. And the title of this podcast is The Two Witness Moses and Elijah Revival. Here's what I wanna do. I wanna talk about the double anointing of the two witnesses. How do we tell the difference between a true revival and a false revival? You see, when Queen Jezebel and King Ahab started a revival in ancient Israel, which included all other religions, how did the prophet Elijah, Eliyahu, respond? What did he say? 1 Kings 18, 21. And Eliyahu came unto the people and said, How long will you halt between two opinions? If Yahuwah is Elohim, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. The spirit of Eliyahu will not be poured out on the Christian church until, or unless, I should say, they remember the law of Moses. How do we know this? Because the pattern is there throughout the scriptures. In Malachi chapter four through five, it says, remember you the Torah, the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. In the next verse, it says, behold, I will send you Eliyahu, Elijah the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of Yahuwah. And then in verse six, it says, and he shall turn the heart of the father to the children and the heart of the children to the father, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Now the King James version uses a plural for fathers, but when you look it up in the Hebrew, it's not necessarily plural. It just says, Ab, father. I believe it should say the heart of the father. Okay. Cause that's the only thing that makes sense. He shall turn the heart of the father to the children and the heart of the children to the father, lest I smite the earth with a curse. So here's the pattern. People in the Christian church always love to sing that song. These are the days of Elijah. Okay, you can sing that song until you're blue in the face. But guess what? The spirit of Elijah is not going to come until you do what? Remember the Torah. Remember the Torah of Moses. You see, it has to happen in this order. We have to go back to the laws of Moses before the spirit of Elijah will come. So there's not going to be any outpouring of any true Holy Spirit until those in the Christian church abandon Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and they embrace the Torah. Now, some people on Facebook were saying, oh, you can't expect a baby to learn how to walk. That's true. We're not talking about the students. We're talking about the leaders, the leaders of the university. The college campuses all across America that know that are supposed to know better. They're supposed to have master's degrees. They're supposed to have PhDs in theology. They're supposed to know their Bibles. And if they really had a prayer life and if they were really in touch with the spirit of Yahuwah, they would know that the law of Moses has not been nailed to the cross. They would know because who taught me this? I didn't go to any college. I didn't get any PhD or any master's degree. It was 
It was because I spent time in prayer, because I spent time seeking Yahuwah, that he made it known to me that the law of Moses is still with us for today, that it's not been nailed to the cross, that it's not been done away with. It's a simple formula, people. There's not going to be a true revival until those in the church come out of her, the mystery Babylon religion. And when they abandon Sunday worship, Catholic communion, when they abandon this notion that we're supposed to gather under the ecumenical one world religion of Pope Francis, when they abandon that idea and they stop inviting all these Jesuits to come and lead a revival for these students across America, that's not how it's going to happen. You're not going to invite all the prophets of Baal to a revival and think that the true spirit of Yah is going to show up. People, wake up. That's not how it's going to happen. Yeah, if he shows up, he's going to show up to do something you didn't expect. Exactly. So the revival that Jezebel and Ahab brought to Israel included pagan holidays, just like Christmas, just like Valentine's Day and Easter. They were singing songs. They were lifting up holy hands. They were worshiping. They were praising. There was beautiful music. And they were uh, prostrating themselves, just like the people at Asbury were doing. But who were they worshiping? Who were they praising? An all-inclusive God. And I say God because I'm pertaining, I'm talking about the false pagan deities. I don't use G-O-D to refer to our Elohim, Yahuwah. But when it comes to the pagan false deities, I'll say G-O-D to, to refer to them. An all-inclusive God. In other words, he can be anyone you want him to be in the pantheon, right? They were worshiping a nameless God. What does the word Baal mean? It means Lord. It's a generic title. It can mean anybody. It can mean anybody. I can remember as a child being in the car, driving somewhere with my parents and my dad had the radio playing and this song comes on the radio by George Harrison, who used to be with the Beatles. And he's singing this song, My Sweet Lord, My Sweet Lord. Okay, and they're singing Hallelujah. And I'm thinking, oh, he's talking about Jesus. Well, he gets to a certain part in the song and they're singing Hare Krishna. And I'm like, what? I was like, you know, seven, eight years old going, Hare Krishna. Okay. So Lord means nothing. Lord can be anybody. It can be Buddha. It can be Krishna. It can be whoever you want it to be. Your landlord, literally. Yeah, exactly. So who were they worshiping? They were worshiping a God who accepts the sin of sodomy who allows sodomites to lead worship. So how do you think the prophet Elijah brought fire down from heaven? Somebody said to me on Facebook, Maria, why don't you start your own revival if you're so holy? And I'm like, how do you think we start a revival? It starts with exposing the false prophets of Baal. That's how it starts. Okay, that's how it starts. It's how did the prophet Eliyahu start a revival? He preached against the universal God of all religions, Baal. And it's up to the heart of man to turn their hearts back to Yahuwah. They have to respond. You know, you as the speaker, if Yahuwah has given you the message, Yahuwah is not like, if you just speak this message, I'm going to take control of the other people and against their will, have them follow me. Mm -hmm. No, Yahuwah puts it in you or in us, to speak the truth. Right. And then it's up to the Ruach in them to respond. That's how a revival happens. The people have to be crying out, and Yahuwah usually brings that prophet to meet their crying out. Right, exactly. So the only difference, and this was, this was spoken to me in a dream back in 2006, Yahuwah spoke to me in a dream, and he says the only difference between the genuine spirit of Elohim and the counterfeit is he said that the genuine spirit of Yahuwah will always uphold the law of Moses and the prophets. 
That's the only difference. Okay, the the real Holy Spirit and the false Holy Spirit. Remember when um, in Egypt, Moses did miracles with his staff and Pharaoh's, you know, sorcerers come in and they duplicate the same miracles. Okay, it looks like the same miracle, doesn't it? Very close. The, look, it, it looks very similar. But what's the only difference? The only difference is that the true Holy Spirit will always uphold the law of Moses and the prophets. But the counterfeit spirit will pretend to embrace the scriptures, but it will be cloaked in Baal worship. Okay. See, as long as the Vatican, that woman Jezebel is the Vatican, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of all harlots, who sits on seven hills, who's clothed in purple and scarlet. She has a cup of filthiness and abominations in her hand. As long as the Vatican is involved and they're the ones orchestrating the revival, make no mistake about it. It cannot be a real revival. I don't care how hungry the students are. I don't care how sincere they are. They can have private revival meetings in their dorms, in their homes, in their, you know, they can go and have private. I'm not saying the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh can't touch these students. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is on a corporate scale, on a corporate scale, when the Vatican orchestrates these false revivals by bringing in prophets of Baal, Jesuits, infiltrators don't expect it to be a true revival that doesn't mean the students aren't being sincere it doesn't mean that they can't experience this true presence of yahuwah in their private prayer times what i'm talking about is on a corporate scale when these false teachers are seducing the people to come under the umbrella of the one world religion of pope francis that is not a true revival and anybody who thinks that it is, is greatly deceived. And you guys need to repent. If you ever thought for one minute that that's what a true revival looks like. In fact, the Apostle Paul, Shaul, calls it the mystery of lawlessness in 2 Thessalonians 2.7. Beloved, we have to pray for these innocent sheep, these College students who are being led astray by the false teachings of men, these ecumenical leaders, they are leading the sheep into a den of wolves. We pray that the unsuspecting sheep come out of her, that they come out of Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, the Vatican. You see, the ministry of the two witnesses will be the true revival, and it will last for 1,260 days. It hasn't started yet, but you see, it will not begin until the remnant within Christianity come out of Mystery Babylon and embrace the truth of the Torah and the prophets. That's why the entire world hates the two witnesses and kills them and sends gifts to one another when they're dead. Okay, but that's not what we've seen at Asbury, have we? We've seen Tucker Carlson. Now, even though they say, oh, well, they turned Tucker Carlson away. I don't care. Just because they turned him away, all that was, was was to get us off their scent so that we think, oh, see, they wouldn't let Todd Bentley speak. Oh, see, they sent Tucker Carlson away. So, see, it, it's student-led. It's student-led. Look, they know, how to, they know how to fake it because they're doing this thing called controlled opposition. They're wise to the people that they know that we could see through their fake, their fakery. So they got to make it look good, right? It's the appearance of piousness. Exactly. The counterfeit always comes before the genuine, just like Ishmael. He came first before the genuine son of promise, Yitzhak. Okay. You know, Ishmael means Bohem has heard as if to say, we're going to do it our way, Elohim. We're going to do what we want. You're going to hear us out. Okay. And what does Yitzhak mean? It means laughter. Because see, the true joy of Yahuwah, the Ruach HaKodesh, is when we do it his way, not our way. See, when Captain Yahu, you know, in the King James Version, they call him Jehu. But what he said, what shalom is there so long as Jezebel 
reigns. As long as the Vatican is involved, as long as that woman Jezebel is involved, you can forget about trying to have a true revival where her hands, her claws are in it. You can have your own revival in, you know, apart from what that woman Jezebel, you can go into your private dormitories and your private homes and seek Yahuwah and have your own private revival. I'm not saying you can't, but on a corporate scale, when they invite these prophets of Baal, these Jesuits to seduce the people into joining Pope Francis and his one world religion, you can forget about it. That is not a true revival. Okay. So, um, let me see here. What else am we going to, I wanted to show this to you. This is a meme I made. I posted it on Facebook. It says, when it has the fingerprints of Jesuit Pope Francis all over it, you know it was orchestrated by the Illuminati, the Vatican, the New World Order, not by the students. Pray for the students to have discernment. Pray that the students come out of her. And how do we test a true revival from a false one? Yesha Yahu, Isaiah 820 says, to the Torah and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. If the leadership of Asbury and all these false prophets that they're bringing in to conduct a a so-called revival, if they're not teaching the Torah, it's because there is no light in them. I've had people that claim to be Torah observant Say to me this week, oh, you can't expect babies to learn how to walk the minute they come out of the womb. I'm not talking about the students. I'm talking about the leadership. I'm not expecting the students to come out of the womb walking. I'm not expecting that. None of us are. We're talking about the leaders. If the leaders are not teaching the Torah to the college students, it is because there is no light in them. Okay, so let's get that straight. There's not going to be a real revival until the students listen to the leadership that is obeying the Torah. And we have to be there for them. We have to, no one else is going to make it happen except for those of us who are part of this corporate two witness army. Okay. Now, I, I posted this on February the 20th, 2023. And I said, beloved of Yahuwah, I see many people on Facebook claiming that scripture does not foretell of an end time revival. However, I'm going to show you that it does. Okay. In second Peter three, eight, we are told that one day is with Yahuwah as a thousand years. Therefore, Yahuwah will revive us after two days or 2000 years. What does it say in the book of Hosea chapter six, verse two? It says, after two days, he will revive us. In the third day, he will raise us up and we shall live in his sight. So if one day is with Yahuwah as a thousand years, two days is the same as 2000 years. In other words, from the time that our Messiah resurrected and ascended back to the father, we're talking 2000 years from that time. It says he will revive us. He will raise us up. So we're still waiting for a revival, but that revival hasn't come yet. Okay. So in this passage, Hosea 6.2, it's describing 2,000 years from when our Messiah ascended back to the Father. After three days would be 3,000 years from Messiah's ascension back to the Father, which is in the eighth millennium when the new heaven and the new earth descends. We read about that in Revelation chapter 21, okay? Scripture does speak of an end time revival during the great tribulation, but it won't begin until the corporate two witnesses have an evangelistic outreach to the world. See, it tells us in Joel 2.28 and also in Acts 2.17 that in the last days that Yahuwah will pour out his spirit upon all flesh, And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your old men shall dream dreams 
and your young men shall see visions. And our Messiah told us exactly when the great tribulation begins. Now, some people think we're already in the great tribulation. I understand why, because of the snake bites. And I'm not, I'm not, de- you know, denying that that's an abomination to the human body. I'm not denying that one bit. But listen to what I'm going to say here. Our Messiah said, when you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation. It has to be something we all can see with our eyes. He says, when you shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, for then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. I believe there's going to be television screens all over the place. Just like you see in New York City, they're like big giant billboards. And everybody's going to be able to see the image of the beast, the clone of Jesus, probably, in the temple in Jerusalem. It's probably going to be mingled with artificial intelligence. It's going to be possessed by a demon, a Nephilim. It's going to be some kind of, you know, crazy, um, demonic, artificially intelligent creature, because it tells us that the image of the beast will be made to speak and life will be given to this image. Okay. See, our Messiah taught us that until heaven and earth passes away, 100% of the Torah and the prophets are still in effect. So heaven represents the spiritual interpretation of prophecy earth represents the literal or the physical interpretation of prophecy. So therefore, heaven and earth are still with us. This means that prophecy is twofold. Oftentimes in scripture, we can see that there's usually a literal interpretation of prophecy, which is the physical or the earthly. And then there's a spiritual interpretation of prophecy. So the human body is our spiritual temple. It houses our spirit. But there's also going to be a literal brick and mortar temple in Jerusalem during the Great Tribulation. I was viciously attacked by a certain person on Facebook a few months ago because I'm teaching this. She was calling me a false teacher. Okay, but let me show you. I'm going to prove it to you in scripture. There's going to be a brick and mortar temple during the great tribulation. Okay, you can read about it in Daniel 8, 11. You can read about it in Daniel eleven thirty one, Daniel 12, 11, Matthew 24, 15 through 21, 2 Thessalonians 2, 4, and Revelation 11, 1 through 2. Now, you go to Revelation 11, 1 through 2, and we are told that the Malak, the angel is told to measure three separate things. The temple, the altar, the people, three separate things. And the Malak is told not to measure the outer court. People, this is clearly speaking of a brick and mortar temple. It's not talking about the human body. Now, that doesn't mean that there's also not an abomination in the human temple. I believe it's both. It's both. Now, I created this graphic back in... It was March of 2020, right after it was shown to me who Trump is, that he's the rider on the white horse. And I made this graphic. You can see what it says. I'm not going to say it with my mouth because I don't want to have my video, you know, taken down. The first abomination of desolation was in 167 BCE with Antiochus Epiphanes IV. His image was on the temple coin. He set up an image of Zeus on December 25th. He sacrificed unclean swine. Um, The second time it happened was in 70 AD. Nero Caesar, um, you know, he was already dead at this point, but it was General Titus who came with his armies. They destroyed Jerusalem. They set up an image of Nero Caesar. Nero Caesar's image was on the temple coin. They sacrificed unclean swine. Now you have the third abomination of desolation, Operation Warp Speed. Mr. T 
on December the 25th, 2020, called it the Great Christmas Miracle. That's what he called it, the Great Christmas Miracle. And now we're going to have a fourth one, a fourth abomination of desolation. He is slated to build the third temple. Now, some people say it's underground. That's not the same thing. That's a, that's a synagogue. What the Illuminati have always wanted is Solomon's temple dripping in gold. We're talking just like a Liberace type of temple. I mean, just just dripping with gold. That's Trump's style all the way. His face is on the temple coin. Okay. And here we have the name Epiphanes, uh, which Antiochus gave himself this title, Epiphanes, which means God manifest in Greek. It has a numerical value of 666. Nero Caesar in Roman numerals adds up to 666. President Donald Trump also adds up to 666. And the V word adds up to 666. Coincidence? No, I don't think so. Okay. Leviticus 11, 4 through 47 tells us, you shall not eat any of these things, rabbit, mouse, swine, pig, horse, dog, human cadaver, carcasses of dead humans, blood, you know, aborted, you know what. We're not supposed to allow these things to come in to, into our bloodstream or our bodies. He says, you shall not make yourselves abominable with any creeping thing that creeps. Neither shall you make yourselves unclean with them that you should be defiled thereby, for I am Yahuwah, your Elohim. So do I believe the human body is a temple? Absolutely. But the prophecy about the abomination of desolation is not limited to this, because it has to be something we have to be able to see with our physical eyes. There's going to be an image made to the beast. And the fact that they came out with this movie on January 13th called the the devil conspiracy where they're planning to clone Jesus from the shroud of Turin and then sacrifice him to Satan. What does that tell you people that that's what they're planning to do? Okay. Now I put this statement out here because people were accusing me of, you know, not being compassionate for those students that were really crying out to Yahuwah, wanting a true revival. They're acting like, Oh, I'm just such a mean person. You know, I'm denying those students from having a true outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Listen, the concern for the college students in America isn't uh, whether or not they are truly seeking to know Yahuwah. The real danger is that they are being given poisoned waters by the ecumenical leaders of the one world religion of Antichrist, Pope Francis. Just because somebody is displaying hunger and thirst does not mean they've been revived. In order for them to be revived, they have to be given pure living water. Let's the redirect them. Us, those of us who know the truth, let's redirect them away from mystery Babylon religion. Let's teach them the same truth that our Messiah taught, which is the Torah and the prophets. And the only way we're going to do that is we have to fast and pray. I'm calling for a revival of the Torah and the prophets, the witnesses, the two witnesses are Torah and prophets. I'm calling for a revival that we fast and pray until Passover. And that in your community, wherever you live, however you are led to do so by the Ruach HaKodesh, that you go out into the streets. You go wherever he leads you and you lead souls to the truth of Mashiach. And that's about the best we can do. And let's pray. Let's do warfare in the heavenlies over all the college campuses across America that these false revivals, even though we're not, we know they're going to happen because scripture says there's going to be a great falling away, that it's going to be a strong delusion to believe a lie. And they're going to do lying signs and wonders. We know this. But let's pray that those who really belong to Yahushua, who are his, that they will not be deceived, that Yahuwah will open their eyes to the truth and that they will come out of her, my people. Okay. Ezekiel chapter nine tells us. Nine, four. We read in Ezekiel that 
there is going to be a, a messenger is sent to Jerusalem in the last days. And this messenger has a slaughter weapon in his hand. And it says, and he cried also in my ears with a loud voice saying, cause them that have charge over the city to draw near even every man with his destroying weapon in his hand. You look at this word, destroying weapon, um, you know, in his hand. I think personally, it could be the V. Could be, okay? Um, And behold, six men came from the way of the higher gate, which lies toward the north, and every man a slaughter weapon in his hand. And that word slaughter is to to smite. Uh, Weapon means an apparatus. It can mean an instrument, um, a tool, you know, can even mean a syringe. Um, And one man among them was clothed with linen with a writer's inkhorn. Now, what do you write with? Graphene is something you write with, okay? A graphic is something that you write with. Okay, a writer's inkhorn. It says safar. It means to uh, use a pen knife, to um, inscribe, to enumerate. Well, they're already enumerating people with tracking devices. Okay, so there's 24 7 surveillance going on with these microchips. So the writer's inkhorn, the ink, what is ink made of? Graphene oxide. Graphene, graphene is something that you that you write with, right? Um, and it says that that the uh, writer's inkhorn was by his side. They went in and stood beside the grazen altar, and the glory of Elo- uh, the Elohim of Israel was gone up from the cherub, uh, cherub, you know, the cherub, uh, whereupon he was to the threshold of the house, and he called to the man clothed with linen which had the writer's inkhorn by his side. And Yahuwah said unto him, go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Yerushalayim, and set a mark, a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that are done in the midst thereof. And what is the mark? You look at that right here. I'm going to hover over it. Try to make it bigger so you can see. Yeah, it's a tall. It's a tall. I'm sorry? Yeah, the tall is the last letter in the Hebrew alphabet. It looks just like a cross. And the reason I showed you that is because the Apostle Paul, Shaul, talks about preaching the cross. What does he mean? He's not talking about worshiping an idol, okay? A true revival will always include the preaching of the cross of Messiah. 1 Corinthians 1.18 says, For the preaching of the cross. In other words, the two sticks of Ezekiel, the tall, the tall. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of Elohim. For after that in the wisdom of Elohim, the world by wisdom knew not Elohim, it pleased Elohim by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. See, the Greek word cross is staros, and it is the same thing as the Hebrew letter tall. In modern Hebrew, they say tav, but it's tall. This is the symbol of the sticks, the two houses of Israel. The Greek word staros also means self-denial. So when the Apostle Paul says that he won't, that, you know, he says that I proclaim to know nothing among you, save Messiah and him crucified. And when he talks about to take up your cross daily and to crucify the deeds of the flesh, to deny yourself, Yahushua told us to deny yourself and take up our cross. He wasn't talking about a single pole. He's talking about the taw, because the taw means the end, the end of self, the end of self. And they weren't preaching this kind of message at Asbury. See, in order to have a true revival, we have to preach self-denial. We have to preach 
you know, denial of the flesh. They weren't doing that at Asbury. You know, worshiping is nice. Lifting up holy hands is nice. Worship music is nice. But there's no revival unless we preach the cross of Messiah. Self-denial. Denying self. Crucifying the deeds of the flesh. If they're not preaching that, there's not going to be the presence of the Ruach HaKodesh. Okay? So... We need to understand how scripture patterns true revival. Okay. And we got 15 minutes left and there's so much more that I want to share. Um, And and we can continue. We can probably end this podcast and start a new one. If you want, I'm probably going to keep going. Um, But I want to talk about who the two witnesses are. Okay. Okay. So we've all noticed when reading the book of Revelation that it's full of symbolism and mystery. However, most, if not all of the book of Revelation cannot be understood properly without first consulting the Torah and the prophets. In other words, from Genesis to Malachi. Okay, you're not going to understand Revelation without understanding Genesis. Deciphering these prophetic pictures requires going back to the beginning. The heavenly messenger. Describe to the Apostle Yehuchanan, John, two witnesses. They will be conducting a final end-time evangelistic outreach to the world. See, theologians and Bible scholars have debated for centuries about who these elusive figures are, supposing that they are a reincarnation of Moses and Elijah. Some have even postulated that it could be Moses and Enoch. However, we must ask ourselves if Revelation 11, 7 tells us that the beast makes war against these two witnesses and he kills them, how can they be Moses and Elijah? Scripture is against the idea of reincarnation. We're told in Hebrews 9, 27, it is appointed unto men once to die and after this, the judgment. Now, when it comes to people like Lazarus, Remember, Lazarus Lazarus was resurrected from the dead um, by our Messiah. Lazarus came back into his mortal body, his finite existence, and lived out the rest of his days. But we know that Moses died. Uh, We know that even though Elijah the prophet was caught up in a chariot of fire, the scripture tells us flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven. So Elijah the prophet could not have gone up in a chariot of fire in his mortal body, he had to lose the mortal body on the way up, right? Now, we did read that Elijah the prophet was taken to another place. You know, there was other scriptures where it talks about he wrote letters to this certain king. Um, So, but eventually, we know Elijah had to die. He had to die to the old body. He couldn't just go to heaven in a mortal, finite body. Okay, so on the way up, he left his finite mortal body. Okay, so it can't be Moses and Elijah, literally speaking. It can't be an Enoch, literally speaking. Okay, I'll explain more as we progress, right? In Revelation 11, 4, it says, These are the two candlesticks and the two olive trees standing before the Elohim of the earth, whole earth. In order to understand who the two olive trees are, Let's go to the first time in scripture where Israel is likened unto an olive tree. Jeremiah eleven sixteen. 16. Yahuwah called your name a green olive tree, fair and of goodly fruit with the noise of a great tumult. He has kindled fire upon it and the branches of it are broken. You see the same concept again in Zechariah and also in Ezekiel. So in Zechariah chapter 4, And he said unto me, what do you see? And I said, I have looked and behold a candlestick of gold with a bowl on top of it and his seven lamps thereon and seven pipes to the seven lamps, which are upon the top thereof and two olive trees by it, one upon the right side of the bowl and the other upon the left side thereof. So I answered and spoke to the Malak 
the messenger that talked with me, saying, What are these, my master? Then the Malak messenger that talked with me answered and said unto me, Know you not what these be? And I said, No, my master. And then by the end of Zechariah, he's given the identity of these two olive trees. Okay, He asks not, not only once, but twice. Okay, Zechariah chapter 4, uh, verses ele verse 11, it says, Then I answered I and said, What are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick and upon the left side thereof? And verse 12, And I answered again and said unto him, What be these two olive branches which through the two golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves? Verse 13, And he answered me and said, Know you not what these be? And I said, No, my master. Verse 14, Then said he, These are the two anointed ones that stand by the master of the whole earth. Now, what's interesting about this verse, verse 14, is that the King James Version says two anointed ones. But when you read it in Hebrew, it says, Bain Yitzhar, which means... You know, Bain Yitzar, which means two anointed sons. So it's not just two anointed ones. It's two anointed sons. Now, why is that significant? Because in Exodus 4.22, Yahuwah called the entire nation of Israel, my son, my firstborn son. Okay, he says it again in Jeremiah 31.9. So now Israel becomes two separate nations after King Solomon died. So when, when he's shown the two anointed sons, the two olive trees represent the two houses of Israel. Okay, the two anointed sons. He's not talking about two individuals. He's talking about two houses of Israel. That's what he's talking about. Okay, And in fact, in Ephesians 2.15, the apostle Paul, Shaul, says that the redeemed Jews and Gentiles, Yahudim and Goyim, all in Messiah, they become one new man. Therefore, we should be able to figure out who the two anointed sons are. They're not two individuals. They are the two anointed corporate bodies of people called the two houses of Israel. In Ezekiel 37, it is important to read verse 14, the, the first 14 verses, excuse me, the first 14 verses to understand what is going on. Who is being described in verse 16 through 19? Well, you won't fully understand who's being described in Ezekiel uh, 37, 16 through 19, unless you read the first 14 verses. In Ezekiel 37, 1 through 14, Yahuwah tells the prophet to speak to the dry bones and to prophesy to them, breathing upon the dead bones, verse 9. In verse 10, after Ezekiel prophesied to the dry bones, they came back to life with new skin, new flesh was placed upon them. Then he is told the identity of these dry bones that are now resurrected. In Ezekiel 37, 10, he says, So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they stood upon, they um, lived, it says they lived and stood upon their feet, an exceeding great army, army. In verse 11, 37, 11, then he said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried and our hope is lost. We are cut off for our parts. Okay, explanation. Did you see who these are? This is a great army. It's a, the whole house of Israel. Now we can understand who the two sticks are in Ezekiel 37, 16 through 19. Additionally, we see that this army is returning on white horses with our Messiah in Revelation 19, 7 through 14. 
See, I keep seeing people say there's not going to be a rapture. You know, we know the word rapture is the Latin word, but in Greek, it's harpazo. People say, oh, there's not going to be a rapture or harpazo. Yes, there is. But it's not going to be until after the thousand, the, the 1,260 days are finished. After the tribulation of three and a half years, the two witnesses are caught up. Okay, I'm going to show this to you because a lot of people don't understand that there is going to be a quote unquote rapture or a hard puzzle. Okay, right here in Revelation 11. Go with me there. Our dead bodies are laying in the streets for three and a half days. It says um, a great voice. They heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, come up here, come up. And the word voice is phone, spelled just like phone. And when you look it up, it literally means a trumpet. Okay, phone. Okay, a great voice from heaven saying to them, come up here. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud and their enemies beheld them. Okay, and the same hour was there a great earthquake. Do you remember what happened when our Messiah died on the cross or the tree? It says in Matthew 27 that all these people who had died, you know, these righteous souls were seen walking around. There was a great earthquake and all these people were resurrected. Okay, the same thing's happening again. There was a great earthquake and there's a great resurrection of souls. This isn't just talking about two individual men, although I do believe there will probably be two individual men who could be kind of like leader leaders of the two witnesses. Like they're the, you know, the leaders of the two corporate groups, perhaps. But, you know, I still believe there's going to be two groups and perhaps also two individuals as well. Because like I said, with prophecy, you usually have a literal interpretation and you have a spiritual interpretation. Okay, because heaven and earth are still with us. Abraham had two kinds of seed. You know, he was told that his seed would be like the sand on the seashore. The sand on the seashore represents the physical descendants, the earthly descendants. Abraham was told that his descendants would be more numerous than the stars of the heavens. That's spiritual, born again descendants. So if there's two types of descendants of Abraham. If heaven and earth are still here, then we have to understand that when we're looking at prophecy, there's usually the literal or the earthly or the physical interpretation. And there's the spiritual or the metaphoric, the metaphoric interpretation. So I often see prophecy as being twofold, twofold. Okay. So these two witnesses are taken up to heaven go to the next chapter 12 and we see the woman okay and there appeared a great wonder in heaven the woman clothed with the sun that woman is jerusalem the apostle paul in galatians 4 26 calls her jerusalem she, he says jerusalem is the mother of us all in isaiah 66 it talks about the woman giving birth okay and that that's talking about jerusalem there in Isaiah 66. And it says that she's clothed with the sun. The moon is underneath her feet. And upon her head is a crown of 12 stars. Because Jerusalem is the capital city of Israel. And she's being given. She's with child. Okay. Now this is proof right here. That 1948 was a legitimate. Um, you know, even though the Rothschilds and the Illuminati were. And the United Nations were instrumental in bringing about the modern state of Israel. Who cares? Yahuwah lays up the wealth of the wicked for the just. So he can use the devil to do his bidding. Just because they were involved, that doesn't mean the modern state of Israel isn't a fulfillment of prophecy. Of course, it's a fulfillment of prophecy. Okay? As we know it from right here, the woman, Jerusalem, has a crown of 12 stars. She's the capital of Israel, not the fake Israel, okay? I mean, even in Zechariah chapter 12, 
We're told that Messiah is going to return to the Mount of Olives. He's going to land his feet where? It says on the Mount of Olives in where? The fake Jerusalem? No, the real Jerusalem. Okay. That's right there. That's proof that Israel did become a nation in 1948. So people that say, oh, that's, that's not the true Israel. You're, you're fooling yourself. Okay. Revelation 12. Okay. It says, and she being with child cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and 10 horns and seven crowns upon his heads. This is talking about the beast, the government of the beast. Okay. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven. Those are the seeds of Abraham, right? Because Abraham had, had seed that was like the stars of the heavens. And he did cast them out to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered for de to devour her child as soon as it was born. And it says in Revelation 12, 5, and she brought forth a man child. Well, who do you think this is? This prophecy is twofold. This prophecy is about the real Messiah, Yahushua, who was born on the Feast of Trumpets in 3 BC. I have done 20 something years of research on that. I've got blogs written about that. If you want to learn more, I'll share them with you. But this prophecy is also talking about the one new man. Paul explained to us, the one new man in Ephesians 2.15. He also explained it in Romans chapter 11. He talked about the wild branches and the natural branches. He talked about, um, you know, these two people coming together to form one new man. And we just read about it in Ezekiel, um, or I'm sorry, in, in, in um, Zechariah. The two anointed sons, okay, they become one. So when the two witnesses are resurrected, they become the resurrected man child, the one new man, okay? That's what's being expressed here. So there is going to be a quote unquote rapture, harpazo, after the two witnesses are killed and they are resurrected, but we're only going to be gone for seven days. Okay, not seven years. The Christian church falsely teaches that the rapture takes place before the tribulation and they say the bride is in heaven for seven years. No, the bride is in heaven for seven days. The Christian church is thinking, uh, we don't need no refiner's fire. Exactly. We don't need to be refined. We don't need to be tried. Exactly. Exactly. And I'm going to show you this meme, this graphic that I made. Okay, so... I say to people all the time, don't confuse the parable of those who are taken or left with those who are gathered into barns or into fire. You see, they're two separate parables, two separate parables. You see, the wicked people are gathered first to the great supper where they shall be eaten by the birds. And it says they shall be cast alive into the lake of fire. That's in Revelation 19, 17 through 20. The bride is then gathered where? To the marriage supper of the Lamb. This is going to take place on earth, on Sukkot. That's in Revelation 19, 7 through 9. Yahushua is going to rebuild the tabernacle of David. We are told in Amos and also in the book of Acts, we are told he's going to rebuild the tabernacle of David that has fallen down. Now, why is he going to rebuild the tabernacle? He's going to build a sukkah for us so that we can have the marriage supper of the lamb with him down here on earth. But before we have the marriage supper of the lamb, what was done in an ancient Hebrew wedding is that the bride and groom would elope in secret before going and having the big celebration with the friends and the family. They would elope in the middle of the night at midnight. In the middle of the night, they would go away and consummate for seven days, okay? So here you see they're left out. They didn't have oil in their lamps. And while they went to buy the oil, the full, you know, the wise virgins told them to go buy the oil. They go buy the oil. By the time they come to, you know, they try to come into the marriage, marriage it's too late. The doors have been shut. So while the wise virgins went in, 
they were taken. They were taken into the wedding hoopah. And when you look up this word taken in the Greek and also in the Hebrew, it means to be taken into marriage. So to be taken doesn't mean to be, it doesn't mean the wicked people get taken somewhere. The people that come up with this teaching have missed the boat. Wicked people don't get taken anywhere. They're gathered to the great battle. Like it says in Revelation 19, they're gathered to the great battle where they will fight in this war and they will be killed and eaten by birds, but they're not getting removed from the earth. But the five foolish virgins have been left out of the wedding. I keep hearing people say that the, that the righteous get left behind and the foolish are taken. No, 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 you're conflating. You're conflating the parable of those that are gathered into barns or into fire with those that are taken or left. Okay. What's the name of the blog that you teach on this? Uh, it's called Remember Lot's Wife, Taken or Left. It's really good. Yeah. So I've got a, a I think it's a three-part YouTube series on it. Uh, okay. So after the wise virgins go into the wedding, what happens in Matthew 25, 10, it says the door was shut. Where does the bridegroom take the bride for a seven day honeymoon? Okay. He says in John 14, two, in my father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. You see in, in ancient Hebrew weddings, the, the bride and groom would get engaged. And after they become betrothed, they don't consummate right away. The bridegroom goes away and he prepares a place for his bride and he builds a honeymoon suite. He builds a little apartment on his father's estate. And then at the appointed time, he comes back for her. And what does he do? He snatches her away in the middle of the night at midnight, just like in the parable of the virgins. Now, why did he do it at midnight? Okay, people say, oh, there's no such thing as a secret rapture. That's a Christian doctrine. No, it's not. Secret rapture, secret harpazo is biblical because the bridegroom would come at night when everybody's asleep and he would snatch the bride away in secret. In fact, I'll show you something. The apostle Paul, Shaul, calls it a secret. In 1 Corinthians 15, he says right here, show it to you. 1 Corinthians uh, 15, he says, Behold, I show you a mystery. Let's look at the word mystery. It's mysterion. It says a secret. Paul says, I show you a mystery. I show you a secret. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall all be changed. In the scriptures version, okay, they use the word secret right here in the scriptures version. He says, see, I speak a secret to you. Okay, we shall not all sleep. We shall be changed. So Hebrew roots people think they're all smart and they think, oh, the Christian church is so stupid. Ho, ho, ho. They believe in a secret rapture. They're not wrong about that. There is a secret rapture or a secret harpazo, to be more accurate. There's a secret harpazo. The bridegroom comes in the middle of the night at midnight when everybody's sleeping, and he snatches the bride away, and Paul says it's a secret. Or if you want to be critical of the Greek, then you can go go to, say, catching away, which is the Hebrew, basically, that's the connotation. Right. So how long is the Hebrew wedding? Well, Jacob and Leah's honeymoon lasted for seven days. We read that in Genesis 29, 27, 28. Samson's wedding feast lasted for seven days. We read that in Judges 4.12 and Judges 4.17. Noah's family were taken into the ark. And it says the ark was taken up from the earth. Okay, the ark was taken up from the earth. The wicked people were left out of the ark. And down here on earth to drown. And guess what? The door was shut. Genesis 7, 16. Just like Philadelphia. He's told, he told Philadelphia that you have an open door that no man can shut. Because why? Once the wise virgins go into the marriage, the door is shut. 
just like in the parable of the ten virgins, the wise virgins went in and the door was shut. Matthew 25, 10. Noah's family went in and the door was shut. Genesis 7, 16. So once Noah's family were inside the ark, <clears throat> they were in there for seven days before the rain began to fall. Genesis 5, 31, Genesis 7, 4, and Genesis 7, 10. So the rain was the day of wrath. When the rain began, that was wrath. That wasn't tribulation anymore. A lot of people in the Christian church conflate tribulation with wrath. They're entirely two separate things. Tribulation, if you look at that word in Hebrew, it means a tight and narrow place. It's a birth canal, right? When a woman goes into travail, when she goes into labor, that's tribulation. She's giving birth. And what comes out of the birth canal? A baby. <laughs> One new man. One new man, <laughs> exactly. right? Mankind comes out of the birth canal. How much more, again, with us being refined or tried right. in the tight and narrow place of tribulation That's right. that we would come out a pure one new man. That's right. Or maybe we'd just be a church with our baggage. <laughs> you know, The wicked people were left out of the ark and they, they stayed down here on earth. They didn't, they weren't taken anywhere. The wicked people didn't get taken anywhere. Look, I got this image here. It says, are these wicked people being taken inside the ark to safety? Or are they being left out of the ark to die in the flood? They're left out. So in the parable of those who get taken and those who get left, who gets taken into the marriage? The wise virgins or the foolish? Obviously, the wise virgins get taken into the marriage and the foolish virgins are left out. And in the story of Noah's Ark, who got taken into the Ark? The wise people, Noah's family, who got left out of the Ark? The foolish people. So I don't know where people are getting this idea that the wicked people get taken and the righteous people get left behind. That's not accurate. Okay, because they're conflating that with the parable about the, the wheat and the tares. The wheat get gathered into barns. You know, and the, the, he gathers first the tares. That's true. He gathers the he gathers the tares first. But the word gather doesn't mean the same thing as taken. I looked up the words. They're completely two separate words. And to let the cat out of the bag in terms of the teaching, they're gathered in the field and left in the field to be burned. So what's really taken is the wheat. The wheat is taken off the field right. into the barn. Exactly. The tares are gathered locally. For destruction. Exactly. So the so the people that are gathered, it says it right here in Revelation 19. You can go with me there to Revelation 19. You'll see it. Okay. And it says here, uh, and I saw a malak standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice saying, to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather yourselves together unto the Supper of the great Elohim, that you may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of them that sit on them and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. So these wicked people were gathered. Where were they gathered to? They were gathered to the great supper, the great supper where they will be eaten by the birds. Okay, they're not taken to some, they're not removed from the earth. So I don't know where people are getting this idea when they say, oh, the, you know, uh, there's no rapture. I want to be left behind. I hear people say that all the time on Facebook. I want to be left behind. I'm like, well, if you want to be eaten by the birds. But so Noah's family were inside the ark for seven days before the rain began to fall. The congregation at Philadelphia were taken into the wedding hoopah. Because, see, they have the open door that no man can shut, Revelation 3, 8. Then you got the congregation of Smyrna. They're like the foolish virgins. Why? Because they have to suffer tribulation for 10 more days. In other words, you see, the wise virgins represent Philadelphia. They get to go into the wedding with Messiah on the Feast of Trumpets. Now, 10 days later on Yom Kippur, there's this other bride 
ready to meet our Messiah at the Mount of Olives. I believe those are the ones that represent Smyrna, right? And in Revelation 2.10, he tells them they have to suffer tribulation for 10 more days. You see, there's 10 days from the Feast of Trumpets until Yom Kippur. The two witnesses are dead for three days before they are taken up to heaven in the wedding hoopa for how long? For seven days. So you add three days plus seven days, you get 10 days. Now, who comes back with Messiah riding on white horses? It says that the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Now, some people say that's the angels. No, let's read here. It says, let us be glad and rejoice, Revelation 19, 7, and give honor to him for the marriage of the lamb has come and his wife, his wife has made herself ready. And to her, it was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the Kodeshim, the saints. She's the army. She's the army. Okay. And how do we know? Because see, in Proverbs, the Proverbs 31 wife, I need to show you this, this is really important. Proverbs 31, we read about the perfect woman. The perfect wife is a prophetic picture of the bride of Messiah. And it says, who can find a virtuous woman? Her For her price is far above rubies. <clears throat> but that word virtuous is ke'il. And when you read it, it says an army, an army. The virtuous woman is an army, okay? Because I hear people argue all the time, oh no, the bride's not getting taken to heaven. We're getting left behind. No, we're not. Because see, what did we read in Ezekiel 37? Who are the dry bones? It's It says a great army stood on their feet. And that army is the whole house of Israel, okay? So that's what we see here in the Valley of the Dry Bones, an exceeding great army, Ezekiel 37, 10. And, and then in verse 11, he says, these are the bones, these bones are the whole house of Israel. And this great army is the two sticks, that Ezekiel is told to put together in Ezekiel 37, 16 through 19. Okay. The house, the stick of Judah and the stick of Ephraim. And this army is clothed in white linen, fine and clean. This is the righteousness of the Kodeshim. You see in the next verses, it is important to look up the meaning of the word stick in Hebrew. It is the word etz, etz in Ezekiel 37. When he's told to take the stick of Judah and the stick of Ephraim, that word is that word stick means tree, tree. Okay. But what is even more telling is that the word the that the word uh, individual individual tree or stick represents a whole nation. So one stick or one tree is the kingdom of Judah, and the other stick or the tree is the kingdom of Ephraim. For the whole house of Israel. So this completely disqualifies the notion that the two olive trees in Revelation 11 are two individual men. Okay. Now I do believe there's going to be two individuals who represent each of these two nations or kingdoms. I don't know who they're going to be yet, but there's no question that these two Olive trees are two houses of Israel. The two witnesses are the two olive trees. Okay. Ezekiel 37, 16. Moreover, you son of man, take you one tree or one stick and write upon it for Yehuda, Judah, and for the children of Israel, his companions. Then take another tree or stick and write upon it for Yahusaf, Joseph, the stick of Ephraim. And for all the house of Israel, his companions, and he says, and join them unto another into one tree or one stick, and they shall become one in your hand. Another witness we have in scripture is in Romans chapter 11. 
Shaul, Paul says, and if some of the branches be broken off and you being a wild olive tree were grafted in among them and with them partake of the root and fatness of the olive tree, boast not against the branches. But if you boast, you bear not the root, but the root bears you. You will say the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief, they were broken off and you stand by faith. Be not high minded, but fear. For if Elohim spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he also spare not you. So now we see who the two olive trees are in Revelation 11. Yahushua told us in Revelation 120, the mystery of the seven golden candlesticks or the menorahs. In Revelation 120, he says they are the seven congregations. Well, out of seven, only two congregations were not rebuked. Who are they? Smyrna and Philadelphia. You see, the two witnesses include the two overcoming assemblies. So there are two olive trees, which are the two houses of Israel, and the two candlesticks are the two overcoming assemblies. So all together, there's four groups of people coming together. And see, we can interpret these two witnesses as two different elements, which is spirit and truth, wisdom and revelation, also Torah and prophets. In other words, we are going to see a balance, a balance taking place with the written word, the written Torah and prophets, as well as the gifts of the Holy Spirit in operation. The two witnesses will operate in both. Somebody said to me this morning, we've already had a revival with a return to the Torah. I'm like, yeah, but it's not complete because most of the people in the Torah observant movement reject the gifts of the Holy Spirit. They think that all tongues is Kundalini. It's not always Kundalini. Okay. Paul talks about the, those that speak with the tongues of angels, the tongues of Malachim. It's a heavenly language. It's like, why would he counterfeit something that doesn't exist? I mean, you only have counterfeit money because real money exists. Right. Right. So how could there be a counterfeit tongues if there's not a real tongues? Right. Okay. So the two witnesses will operate in both. They will have the baptism of the Holy Spirit and fire with signs and wonders following, but they will also obey the Torah. This is what's missing in the Torah observant, you know, movement. This is what's missing among the Netzarim or the Messianics, if you will, whatever you want to call it, Hebrew roots, Netzarim. This is what's missing. People reject the gifts of the spirit. They think all of it is Kundalini. No, it's not always Kundalini. How do we know the difference? If the true Ruach HaKodesh is always, always going to confirm and uphold the law and the prophets, the Torah and the prophets, okay? So these two witnesses in Revelation eleven six, 6, they do the same exploits as Moshe and Eliyahu. In other words, Moses and Elijah. They carry the same anointing as Moses and Elijah. It doesn't mean that Moses and Elijah are coming back as a reincarnation, okay? In other words, the Jews, the Yehudim who have the Torah, and then there's the born-again Gentiles who have the Holy Spirit or the gift of prophecy, together these elements will make up the double portion anointing. See, when these former Gentiles who follow our Messiah, typified in Ephraim, when they come together with the house of Yehuda. In other words, the one new man, Ephesians 2.15, one stick, Ezekiel 37, 16 through 17, they will become a corporate body of believers who carry the double portion anointing of Moses and Elijah. Okay. Every lunar month, every month on a lunar cycle is called a new moon, a new cycle, Rosh Kadesh, head of the month. So for seven months, there's a trumpet sounded to usher in the new month. Every month, we're supposed to sound the shofar. In the seventh month of Etanim, or Tishri, is when the seventh messenger 
sounds the shofar. This is when the two witnesses will be resurrected. In other words, it's going to be in the seventh month of the year on the Feast of Trumpets. This is the last trumpet of the year of the feast cycle. This is the, the last trumpet that Paul talked about in 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 53. Now there's two other trumpets, silver trumpets, that are sounded on Yom Kippur. That's a different set of trumpets. But the one that's talked about when Paul talks about the last trumpet, you have to understand that on the Feast of Trumpets, there are four trumpets that are sounded traditionally, four different trumpets. Those four different trumpet blasts represent the four angels from the four winds of heaven, the four directions that gather the elect from the four corners of the earth. So there's four trumpets. The last of those four trumpets is when the two witnesses are caught up to heaven. So in other words, we see two witnesses that are the overcoming congregations of Smyrna and Philadelphia. They are symbolized by these two menorahs, these two candlesticks, the two houses of Israel, which are Ephraim and Yehuda. They're symbolized by the two olive trees. So these two witnesses are not literally Moses and Elijah, not literally speaking, as many theologians have taught us over the years. Neither can it be Enoch because... Many people have speculated about that as well. But like I said, I do believe the two witnesses may have two individual men that will, will represent them. Um, so in other words, when Philadelphia and Smyrna come out of the mother harlot system, they will join themselves to the two houses of Israel and they will become their companions. Okay. And so we already know that the two olive trees, who they are, that we write about that in Jeremiah eleven sixteen that Israel was called an olive tree. Later on, Israel was split into two separate nations in 1 Kings 12 and became known as the house of Judah, the two southern tribes, and the house of Ephraim, the ten northern tribes. And then as in Ezekiel 37, 16 through 17, we see the same thing again, the stick of Ephraim and the stick of Yehuda. Okay. These are the both houses of Israel. And um, let's see here. <clears throat> In Revelation 1.20, our Messiah said, tells us the mystery of the seven stars, he says, which you saw in my right hand, the seven golden candlesticks, and the seven stars are the Malachim, the messengers of the seven assemblies. And the seven candlesticks which you saw Saul are the seven assemblies. Therefore, the two candlesticks represent the two overcoming assemblies because they've been, they overcome by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, Revelation 12, 11. In other words, they overcome the sinful nature by accepting the blood of the lamb as atonement for their sins. But they also obey the commandments because they have the two tables of testimony deposited into their hearts. The law has been written in their hearts and in their minds. Okay. Um, now, I just want to say that um, the two witnesses, there's several reasons why Elijah, Enoch, or Moses cannot be the two witnesses. In Revelation 11, 7, it says that at the end of the ministry of the two witnesses, the beast overcomes them and kills them. This means that the two witnesses will have to put on corruptible flesh again, mortal flesh again. Well, that, that's talking about reincarnation, and Scripture does not support the idea of reincarnation. It says in Hebrews 9.27, it is appointed unto men once to die, and after this the judgment. We're told in Ecclesiastes 12, 7, 6 and 7 that when we die, the spirit goes back to Elohim who gave it. It's the hum it's the body that sleeps in the grave. Okay. Our this idea of soul sleep is not biblical. Okay. Our soul doesn't sleep. Uh, when our spirit and our soul, our neshama, goes back to heaven. That's why Paul said to be absent from the body is to be present with Yahuwah. Okay. So when we die, our spirit and our soul, our neshama immediately go back, go to heaven, and we are absent from the body and present with Yahuwah, but our body decays in the ground, okay? 
Um, and El- Elijah was taken up in a whirlwind by a chariot, but he had to put on incorruptible immortality in order to inherit the kingdom. Um, you know, 1 Corinthians 15, 50, we're told that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom. Now, some people argue that Elijah or Eliahu was taken to another place, not to heaven, as we read in 2 Chronicles 21, 12 through 20. We do read an, an account where Eliahu, Elijah, had been taken somewhere else. Ten years later, he wrote a, a letter to King Judah, King of Judah, but Eliahu did not remain alive forever. He had to die to his mortal body at some point. Nobody knows when, because scripture is silent about this. So the two witnesses are not Moses and Elijah coming back. Okay. Do you remember when um, John the Baptist, the Pharisees asked him, you know, are you Elijah? He denied it and said, no, I'm not Elijah. He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But then they asked our Messiah and he said, he was the Elijah that you were expecting. So it sounds like a contradiction, but it's really not. John was saying, no, I'm not literally Elijah reincarnated, but our Messiah said he was that Elijah. In other words, John came in the power of Elijah. He came in the spirit of Elijah. Okay, it wasn't like he was a reincarnation of Elijah. He came in the spirit and the power of Elijah. That's the same thing that the two witnesses are going to be. They're going to come with the same anointing as Moses and Elijah. Okay, and we know this. Because right here in Revelation eleven six, it says, These have power to shut heaven, that it rains not in the days of their prophecy. That's Elijah. Elijah prayed that it wouldn't rain for three and a half years. And it says that they have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues. That's Moses. Moses commanded plagues on Egypt. So in other words, these two witnesses are going to have the same anointing as Elijah and the same anointing as Moses, okay? Um, And I remember back in 2007, I was praying and saying, Father, what is the double portion anointing? Because, you know, we read about this in the book of Kings where the prophet Elisha was asking the prophet Eliyahu, Give me a double portion of your spirit. And so it was kind of confusing because I thought, well, how do you get a double portion of the Holy Spirit? You either have the Holy Spirit or you don't. So it doesn't make sense. What does that mean? And I asked the father, what is it? And he shows me an open vision of the Mount of Transfiguration, which is in uh, Matthew chapter 17 where the disciples have, they see Messiah and he's standing there with both Moses and Elijah, Eliyahu. So you see Moses and Elijah are together all the time. They are together. Okay. So in order for us to carry the double portion anointing, we have to carry the anointing of Moses and Elijah. Okay, I'm not going to finish the rest of it. The point I'm making is that, you know, we have a witness here in Malachi for Moses and Elijah. The, the anointing of Moses and the anointing of Elijah, which is right here in Malachi 4. Okay, we are told that we have to remember the law of Moses. Okay, and then he will send Elijah, the spirit of Elijah. Okay, then we're told in Matthew 17 that our Messiah operated in this double portion anointing, okay? Because they see the at the Mount of Transfiguration, the disciples see Messiah and he's with Moses and Elijah, okay? So Yahushua operated in both kinds of anointing, the anointing of Moses, which is Torah, obedience, and the anointing of Eliyahu, Elijah, which is the prophetic, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, okay? And then we see it again in Revelation 11, 
Verse 6, the exploits that these two witnesses do. They do the same exploits as Moses, and they do the same exploits as Eliyahu or Elijah. So people, there's not going to be a real revival. You can't have a true revival without the anointing of Moses and the anointing of Eliyahu. In other words, Torah and prophets, spirit and truth. Now's the time. We need those of us who operate in both, that we are obedient to Torah and we operate in the gifts of the Ruach HaKodesh, um, especially with praying in tongues, which is the language of angels, the tongues of angels. Um, it's supposed to sound like gibberish. And I'll prove that to you really quick. Before I close with this, I got to show this to you. If you go with me to Isaiah 28, uh, Yeshayahu 28, the way Yahuwah said he was going to bring Ephraim into Torah obedience is he says, for with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to the people. You look this word up in stammering in Hebrew, la'ag, it literally means a buffoon. To mock a foreigner, it actually means to speak in gibberish. It speak. It means to speak unintelligibly. So the reason why the gift of tongues sounds like gibberish is because the devil can't understand what we're saying. When we speak in the tongues of angels, the tongues of Melakim, it's because it's a heavenly language. Of, it's of a heavenly orange origin, excuse me. And what happens by the time it reaches the throne in heaven, Yahuwah is hearing our prayers in his pure Hebrew language. That's why in Romans chapter 8, it says that the Ruach HaKodesh prays for us with groanings that cannot be uttered, for he knows what is the mind of the Spirit, for he makes intercession for the Kodeshim, the Kodeshim, the saints, according to the will of Elohim. So praying in tongues is the um, is praying in Hebrew. Because the most, because the Hebrew language originated in heaven. I mean, who do you think taught Adam and Eve to speak in the pure Hebrew language? It was Yahuwah himself. He taught them to speak in the Hebrew language. And we're told in Genesis that the whole earth spoke this one pure language at one time until the Tower of Babel. So on the day of Pentecost, they weren't speaking in earthly languages. In Acts chapter 2, it says each man heard it in his own language. The miracle was in the hearing. Each man heard it in his own language. The Ruach, the Holy Spirit, interpreted the message in each man's ear so that he could hear it in his own language. But the disciples were not speaking in earthly languages. So if each person heard it in their own language, I wonder how many different people were there. I mean, right. Were there like 70 nations were there? Were there like 50 nations? Did these 12 or 15 or 20 people speak in 50 or 70 languages? Again, the, the, the miracle was in the hearing. Exactly. See, in Acts 2, 3, it says there appeared unto them cloven, cloven tongues of fire. What does that mean? Cloven, divided. But why cloven? Leviticus 11, it says that the clean animals are cloven footed. But the unclean animals are not cloven-footed. Aha! In other words, clean lips. What, is it, what was Isaiah talking about when he says, Woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips. See, Isaiah, Yeshayahu, I am undone, for I am a man of unclean lips. And you look up this word, unclean lips, it's Tame Safa. And he says, I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Languages of the nations. So why would Yahuwah give us earthly languages? No, he didn't give them earthly languages in the second chapter of Acts because that's considered unclean. No, he gave them clean languages, cloven, cloven tongues of fire. Cloven means clean. Okay, and why? Because we are of a, of a heavenly city. We belong to a heavenly city called the New Jerusalem. Doesn't it make sense we're going to get a new language to go along with our new citizenship? 
of this heavenly city a heavenly language? I've always thought of it as the tongues is a is is the uttering of the ruach out loud. That's right. I mean, right here, Paul the apostle makes a distinction. He says, "Though I speak with the tongues of men, meaning human, or the tongues of angels, malakim." He's making a distinction. One is earthly, one is heavenly. So tongues is heavenly. And Yahuwah tells us we're going to be restored back to a pure language. What does it say in Zephaniah, Zephaniah chapter 3, 8 and 9? It says that in that day, we're going to be restored back to a pure language. That pure language is the original Hebrew that Yahuwah taught to Adam and Eve in the garden. Before, you know, the, 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 the Hebrew language we have today, it's picked up the dialects of the nations. So the pure Hebrew, that's what we're going to be speaking in the new millennium. But in order for us to, to speak that pure Hebrew, we have to speak in tongues of angels because the tongues of angels is going to help to purify our lips. That's why he gives us tongues of fire. That's why the seraphs, takes the coal and cleanses the lips of Isaiah. Okay, the coal from off the fire. He, you know, he didn't literally burn his lips with fire. It's supernatural fire. So we need the gift of tongues if we're ever going to operate in the anointing, in this end time anointing that's going to sweep across the world and take the world by storm. We need to have a revival of the two witnesses. And I'm asking you guys to join with me and let's fast and pray during the season of Pesach, Passover. Pray for us to be raised up in these last days as this corporate two witnesses that we will bring our own revival to the world, a revival of Moses and Elijah. You who will bless you and keep you, you who will make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Yahuwah lift up his countenance upon you and give you shalom. We hope you've enjoyed today's broadcast and that you are encouraged in your walk with Messiah. For more teachings, subscribe to our YouTube channel and click the bell to be notified of our latest content. Visit Maria's many blogs at doubleportioninheritance.com. That's doubleportioninheritance.com. This ministry is made possible by the prayers and support of listeners like you. To make a donation by PayPal or Venmo.com, use the email address doubleportioninheritance at gmail.com. That's doubleportioninheritance at gmail.com. On behalf of Maria and Gary at Double Portion Inheritance Ministries, may Yahuwah bless you.